somesthetic and visceral sense receptors. This may the first one in this touch and pressure the receptors are Merkleus disc, Meissner's corpuscles, Pacinian corpuscles, Ruffini's end organ and free nerve ending are the receptors for touch and pressure. Now for the receptors of the pain is free nerve ending and receptors of cold is crosses end organ. Receptors of warm is again free nerve ending. Receptors of proprioception are muscle spindle and Golgi tendon organ. Then cristae and macula of vestibular apparatus. These are the receptors of proprioception. Chemoreception, chemoreception is done by carotid body, central chemoreceptors in the brainstem and glucoreceptors in the hypothalamus. Baroreceptors in the body are carotid sinus baroreceptors, afferent arteriole of the renal artery and left ventricular mechanoreceptors. These are some example for these are the baroreceptors in the body. Now there is another term called extroreceptors. Extroreceptors are the receptors which send an immediate external environment. Example touch, pain, heat, cold receptors. So these are called extroreceptors. Immediate ex which send information which information immediate from an immediate external environment. Telereceptors. Telereceptors are the receptors where the origin of the stimulus come from a far distance. Example, vision and hearing. These are the telereceptors. Now, introreceptors. Introreceptors are the receptors which detect any change in the internal environment. Example is baroreceptors, chemoreceptors. Now, the proprioceptors. These are the receptors which deals with degree of torn, contraction of the skeletal muscle, degree of flexion extension and other movements of the joints. Example is receptors, these receptors are muscle spindle and Golgi tendon organ. Muscle spindle which provide information about change in the muscle length and Golgi tendon organ provide information about the muscle torn. Golgi tendon organs are located at the junction of the muscle and tendon. It consists of a capsule made up of concentric sheets of cytoplasm. Inside the capsule, there are small bundles of tendon fibers. This organ is innervated by one or more myelinated nerve fibers which divide to form several branches. These are the recept these receptors are stimulated by a pull up on the tendon which during active contraction of the muscle. The next time of type of receptors are proprioceptors are muscle spindle. These are spindle shaped sensory organ situated at the skeletal muscle. The spindle is bounded by a fusiform connective tissue capsule within which there are few muscle fibers of special kind. These fibers are called intrafusal fibers, whereas extrafusal fibers constitute the main bulk of the muscle. Now, each muscle spindle contains 6 to 14 intrafusal fibers. So, it is made up of mainly that is the may, uh, this there are intrafusal fibers are present in the in the muscle spindle and the for the muscle it is extrafusal fibers. Each spindle contains 16 to 14 intrafusal fibers. Now, these fibers contain several nuclei that are located near the middle of the fiber. These are called nuclear bag fibers. So, this uh, in, the, in the intrafusal fibers, there are, there are several nucleus located in the middle of the fiber. This is called nuclear bag fibers. In, in other intrafusal fibers, nuclei lie in a single chain without any dilatation. This is called nuclear chain fibers. So, two types of fibers. Intrafusal fibers are there, nuclear bag fibers and nuclear chain fibers. Nuclear bag fibers are the fibers where nuclei are located in the middle of the fiber, several nuclei located at the middle of the nucleus. But nuclear chain fibers are a single nuclei without any dilatation is located in, uh, in as a single chain is called nuclear, nuclear, the nucleus lie in a single chain 
is called without dilatation is called nuclear chain fiber. Several nuclei in the nuclear back fibers several nuclei located and the uh, nuclear chain fibers means nuclei located as a chain without any dilatation. Now each muscle spindle is innervated by sensory as well as motor nerve. There are sensory two types of sensory uh, there are two types of nerves are there primary and secondary. Primary uh, sensory are rapidly adapting and secondary are slow adapting nerves. Muscle spindle provide information to the CNS about the extended extent and rate of change in the length of muscle. What is the length? What is the change in the length of muscle? How much change is the in the length of the muscle? It is a, to and it gives information to the CNS regarding this. Now, once we discuss about the receptors, what are the properties of receptors? The one important property peculiarity is specificity of the response. That is each receptor respond to a specific type of stimulus. For example, is rods and cones respond to the light. It never responds to an other olfactory or any other pain or pain stimulus. So, rods and cones special for the light receptor. These are the light receptors only. So, the first one is response will be specific. Each receptor responds to a specific type of stimulus. So, so, example is roads and cones are activated only by light. Next one is another law called Web, another, a law called Weber Fechner law. For example, there is a sub in, in there is a stimulus, there is a stimulus is given to a receptor. And consider it is 10, and the sense perceived is 1. Now, if you are increasing the intensity. Tenfold, you are giving a hundred, but the perception intensity won't be won't become ten times. It become only doubled. For example, if you are using a small pin and making a prick, a small prick. So intensity is this. If you are using a high intensity, the pain perceived will be. Uh, if you are using a with a small needle and making a small prick, soft prick. So, the pain perceived will be there will be an amount of pain will be there. Now, if you are using the same needle a with high intensity prick that is 10 times of the previous prick, but the pain produced will not be 10 times it will be the pain will be only doubled. That is our body can perceive pain due to low intensity stimulus. For example, a severe crushing injury does not cause a death due to pain. So, this is called Weber Fechner law. Now, third type of third peculiarity of this receptors are its adaptation. That is whenever a receptor whenever a, you are giving a stimulus in the initial time it responds vigorously and there is will be a time come it will not response. As the stimulus continues at times comes when the receptors despite of the presence of the stimulus stop the response to the stimulus. For example, I will tell you when a person is put on clothes in the beginning he will be aware of wearing the clothes, but later it comes that time passes he will not be aware of regarding he will not be beware of regarding that clothes. So, this is called adaptation, but not all the stimulus will be uh, will go for adaptation. So, only some uh, only some stimulus some receptors go for adaptation. There are some receptors who now which does not develop an adaptation example pain, pain never develop an adaptation or muscle spindle never develop an adaptation. Now, another exam another peculiarity of the uh, the receptor is its generator potential. So, when a receptor is stimulates it develop a non propagated current called generator potential. When the generator potential is sufficient the action potential develop and conduct the impulses. So, whenever you are giving a stimulus in the receptor a generator potential will be produced. Now, if the generator potential is sufficient it develop it 
causes an action potential and conduction of impulses. Otherwise, it won't conduct the impulses. This session we will be discussing about the reflexes and reflex arc, the pathway of reflexes. Reflex can be defined as a mechanism by which sensory impulse is automatically converted into a motor effect through the involvement of a central nervous system. That is, a sensory impulse is automatically converted into a motor effect very fast through the central nerve, the, but the central with the effect but there is along with that there is involvement of central nervous system is there. An inborn and rapid response to a stimulus from an external environment. So, the automatic response that occurs very rapidly and without conscious control. There will be a response which is very rapid and without it is without a conscious control is called reflex. So, there will be a stimulus from an external environment, an inborn rapid, uh, an inborn as from a to a stimulus, and a response will be a rapid step uh, response will be the without a conscious control is called a reflex. So, for a reflex action, there will be uh, there must be a will, and there must be a motor effect without participation of will. So there will be a motor response without participation of will this is called reflex. Now, the reflex may be a spinal reflex or a brainstem reflex or a cortical reflex. Now, what is the pathway of reflex? How the reflex occurs? The pathway of reflex is called reflex arc. Reflex arc can be defined as a neural pathway that mediates a reflex action. Now, the reflex arc what are the parts of a reflex arc? It consists of a there will be a receptor which receives the stimulus. Then there will be an afferent nerve which transfer information to the sender. Then there will be a sender which coordinate the information and there will be an efferent nerve which returns the which gives the action which gives the that is afferent nerve motor action and there will be an efferent organ which takes action. So, a reflex arc, it is a pathway of reflexes. So, it consists of a receptor, an afferent nerve, a center, efferent nerve and effector organ or efferent organ. Now, this the reflexes can be classified into four types. The first one is a superficial reflex, second one is a deep reflex. Another type of reflex is a visceral reflex. Another type of reflex, inborn or acquired reflexes. Now, the superficial reflexes. Superficial reflexes are polysynaptic reflexes elicited by uh, stimulating skin or mucous membrane, result in contraction of the muscle or a group of muscles. So, superficial reflexes, the receptors will be at the skin or the mucous membrane. So, it can be stimulated by these are polysynaptic reflexes where lots of synapses are there. Polysynaptic reflexes and can it causes once this this causes contraction of muscle or a group of muscle. Example are conjunctival or and corneal reflexes, pupillary reflexes, gag reflexes, superficial abdominal reflex, plantar reflex, anal reflex, and cremastric reflex. So, so we will go through each reflexes in detail. First, first superficial reflex, it is a conjunctival and corneal reflex. That is, this reflex can be elicited by touching the bulbar conjunctiva or corneo conjunctival junction with a wisp of cotton. So, once you are touching the bulbar conjunctiva or corneo conjunctival junction with a wisp of cotton, what will be the reaction? There will be a reflex reaction, blinking of both eyes. So, this is a reflex. So, we take a uh, wisp of cotton, try to touch the bulbar conjunctiva or corneo conjunctival junction and there will be blinking of both eyes. This is a reflex. Now, here the reflex arc will be, there will be touch receptors, that is receptors are touch receptors. Then the sensory uh, afferent are 
the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve the afferent are ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve then the center is pons for this reflex and the efferent is the facial nerve and the effector muscle or the the efferent muscle is orbicularis oculi muscle so conjunctival and corneal reflexes are this is this reflex can be elicited by touching the bulbar conjunctiva or corneo conjunctival junction with a wisp of cotton and uh, the result will be blinking of the eyes so the center is pons here another example of superficial reflex is pupillary reflex there are two types of pupillary reflex are there direct and indirect light reflex and accommodation reflex light reflex is tested by shining the torch to the eyes bringing from lateral side so if you are training the torch uh, direct light reflex is tested by shining the torch to the eyes bringing from lateral side result is you can see the constriction of pupil this is direct light reflex indirect uh, light reflex is shining the torch on your eyes causing constriction of pupils on the opposite eye if you blink if you uh, shine the torch to one eye it causes constriction of the pupil on the opposite eye this is due to crossing of the fibers at the level of optic chiasma so pupillary reflex are two types of pupillary reflex are there first one is direct and indirect light reflex direct light reflex means if you are shining the torch to the eyes bringing from the lateral side you can see constriction of pupil and indirect light reflex is one once you are shining the torch on your eyes uh, con on one eye causes constriction of the pupil on the opposite eye but this is because of mainly the crossing of the fibers at the level of optic chiasma now what is the what is the reflex arc for this light reflexes first of all rods and cones these are the receptors now optic nerve is the afferent fiber the center is the midbrain then oculomotor nerve is the efferent fiber and sphincter 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 pupillae is the uh, effector organ or efferent organ next type of reflex is the accommodation reflex we discussed there are two types of pupillary reflex first one is direct and indirect light reflexes and the second one is accommodation reflex accommodation reflex is that we ask the subject to look far and then suddenly to the nearest object we are asking him to look far and then suddenly to the nearest object there you can see the convergence of eyeball like this we are asking him to look far and nearest object we can see the convergence of eyeball and constriction of pupil the reflex arc is as same as that of light reflex now in certain conditions this reflex is absent in conditions like neurosyphilis of the uh, pup uh, neurosyphilis this reflex is absent but in uh, in condition like argel robertson people a bit accommodation reflex is present but pupillary reflex is absent next type of reflex superficial reflex is the gag reflex here we are it is tested by touching the posterior pharyngeal wall with a cotton swab or cotton stick so with a cotton cotton stick touch the try to touch the posterior pharyngeal wall now what will be the response this is a nauseating effect a vomiting effect will be there so this is called gag reflex now that the receptors are touch receptors uh, are the touch receptors the afferent fibers are glossopharyngeal nerve medulla as the center and vagus nerve is the nerve the efer efferent nerve and the muscle act or the efferent muscles are the pharyngeal muscles now in case of any of the palsy of any of the nerve for example glossopharyngeal palsy or vagus palsy this reflex will be absent that is ninth nerve and 10th nerve palsy this reflex may be absent so gag reflex is tested by touching the posterior pharyngeal wall pharyngeal wall with a cotton swab stick 
Another type of superficial reflux is abdominal reflux. This is exactly a spinal reflux. This is tested by we are asking the subject to lie relaxed in supine position with an uncovered abdomen. Now, stroke the abdominal fall from lateral to the medial aspect. It causes contraction of the underlying musculature. That is superficial abdominal reflux. We are stroking the abdominal wall from lateral to the medial aspect. It causes contraction of the abdominal musculature. Here the spinal segment is T7 and T12, T7 to T12. So it is a spinal reflux. So the center is at the spinal cord and it is the sec spinal segment, the center is T7 to T12. So these reflexes are absent in upper motor neuron lesion above the spinal level. Next is the other, uh, it's, it's uh, reflux arc is, the first of all, the receptors are touch receptors. Now, the, the uh, afferent organ is, afferent nerve is sensory spinal nerve. The center is T7 to T12 spinal segment. Now, if afferent nerve is the motor part of the T7 to T12, and the muscles or afferent muscles or afferent organ is or affector organ is the abdominal muscles. Next type of reflux is the, so another superficial reflux is the plantar reflux. Now we are asked, we are just scratching the skull of, or, 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 sole of the foot. Now what will be the, uh, the reaction? Plantar flexion of the great toe and other fingers. Now, there are in some conditions, there in for example, in some conditions, there is a, a, a there is a sign called Babinski sign is there. If you in the Babinski sign means, if you scratch the sole of the foot, there will be dorsiflexion of the great toe and fanning out of the other fingers. Unless the subject is infant or post epileptic edema, Babinski sign indicates the pyramidal tract lesion. So, plantar reflux is that is once you scratch the sole of the foot, there is plantar flexion of the great toe and other fingers. But in case of pyramidal tract injury or in infants or in post epileptic coma, there is a sign, there is an abnormal reflux can be seen. This is called Babinski sign. So, when you once you scratch the sole of the foot, you will get the dorsiflexion of the great toe and fanning out of the other toes or other fingers. This is called Babinski sign. Next type of reflux is the anal reflux. Anal reflux here, the soft skin around the anus produces contraction of the once you uh, use the, the contraction of the anal sphincter. That is, center is S3 to S4. Another type of reflux, another type of superficial reflux is cremastric reflux. That is stroking the skin on the medial thigh produces the movement of the testicle upwards. Center is L1. Now these were the superficial reflexes. So there are some deep reflexes also. Deep reflexes are exactly the tendon reflexes and usually the, the, the receptors are usually the muscle spindles. There are lots of tendon reflexes, jerks are available, there are jaw jerks, there are jaw jerks. Jaw jerks are there, bicep jerks are there, tricep jerks are there, supinator jerks are there, knee jerks and knee jerk, angle jerks etc. These are the important the tendon reflexes or deep reflexes. The first one is the jaw jerk. We are asking the subject to open mouth a little. Place the finger, place one finger on his cheek. Tape it, tap it with other hand or a knee hammer. <coughs> the result will be contraction of the muscles with closing of the jaw. This is called a jaw jerk. Asking the subject to open the mouth a little, place the finger finger on his cheek, tap it with other hand or with a knee hammer, result is the contraction of the muscles closing of and the closing of the jaw. Next one is the bicep jerk, another deep reflex is bicep jerk. 
Here the elbow will be fla flexed at right angles with the forearm placed in a semi pronated position. Examiner places the thumb or index finger on the biceps and strike with a knee hammer, the biceps contracts. Now the, the receptors are stretch receptors. Now the afferent nerve is the musculocutaneous nerve which supplies to the, which is the afferent supply to the uh, biceps. And the, uh, in the center is C5 to C, C5 and C6 segments. And the efferent is again the musculocutaneous nerve. The effector organ is the biceps muscle. So this is the bicep jerk. Next is the triceps jerk. Triceps jerk, in order to do the triceps jerk, stretch the elbow and allow the forearm to rest on the chest, subject's chest. Then ta uh, tap the biceps tendon, there will be contraction of the triceps. The receptors are stretch receptors. The afferent nerve is the radial nerve. Sender is C6 and C7. Efferent nerve is the radial nerve. Again, the radial nerve and the effector organ or the efferent organ is triceps muscle. Next type of deep reflux is the supinator jerk. For in order to do the supinator jerk, keep the forearm in mid prone position and blow over it over the styloid process causing the contraction of the brachioradialis. So again, the receptor is the stretch receptor, afferent is the radial, radial nerve, sender is C5, C6, efferent is again the radial nerve and efferent muscle is the brachioradialis muscle. Next type of jerk is the knee jerk. For in order to do the, uh, produce the knee jerk, stroke the patellar tendon. The subject should be in sitting position and you just stroke the patellar tendon. It causes an extension of the knee by the contraction of the quadriceps. Then receptors are stretch receptors. Nerve, the afferent nerve is the, afferent nerve is the femoral nerve and L, uh, L3, L4 is the sender. L2, L, L2 through L2 to L4 is the sender and efferent nerve is the femoral nerve and quadriceps femoris is the uh, muscle. Now angle jerk. In order to do angle jerk, place the lower limb on bed so that it is slightly everted and slightly flexed. With one hand, slightly dorsiflex the foot so that it stretches the Achilles tendon. Strike the tendon with knee hammer, response will be contraction of the calf muscle. The receptors are stretch receptor, sender is S1 and S2 and the efferent organ is calf muscle. Now clonus. When a muscle is subject to a sudden continuous stretch, there is a regular oscillation of contraction. This is called clonus. Now sustained clonus is seen, usually seen and at upper motor neuron lesion. There are two types of clonus usually seen, patellar clonus and angle clonus. How to test for angle clonus? In order to test the angle clonus, bend the subject's knee slightly and support with one hand. Grasp the forefoot with one hand and suddenly dosiflux the forefoot. So you will get the clonus. To elicit the patellar clonus, suddenly move the patella downward. You can see the clonus in the patella. Now, usually, we discuss the deep tendon reflexes. Deep tendon reflexes are exaggerated in upper motor neuron lesion. And it decreases or absent in lower motor neuron lesion. So, if there is lesion in the upper neuron, motor neuron, it causes the deep tendon reflex get exaggerated. An exaggerated reflex will be there. But in case of a lower motor neuron lesion, this deep tendon reflexes become decreased or absent. Now what are the properties of reflexes? The first one is delay. That is between the application of stimulus and starting of the response, there is a time interval called delay. It is due to the passage of impulses through synapses. The delay is minimum for monosynaptic reflexes and more in polysynaptic reflexes. That is 
once you apply a stimulus or once there is a stimulus and there is a response. So, the stimulus has to pass through the impulses has to pass through the efferent nerve it reaches the sender and it passes through the effect efferent nerve and reaches the organ. Now, if it is a monosynaptic reflex the the reaction will be fast and if it is a polysynaptic reflex when compared to monosynaptic it will be a bit slow. And this time period between the application of the stimulus and the, the starting of the response in that time interval is called delay. Next one is next uh, feature is my next property is summation. There are two types of summation usually seen temporal and spatial summation. Now, <coughs> temporal summation means if you are applying a sub threshold stimulus, a stimulus which does not produce usually a stimulus which is a small stimulus you are it says less than that threshold a stimulus you are applying there will not be any response. Now, apply a second stimulus second sub threshold stimulus quickly taking care of the refractory period of the nerve. Now, the reaction there will be now a response occur although each stimulus are individually sub threshold this is called temporal summation that is you are first of all you are applying a sub threshold stimulus a sub threshold stimulus is a stimulus which does not produce a response which does not have that much effect to produce a response. So, you are applying a sub threshold stimulus. So, once you apply a sub threshold stimulus usually there will not be any response but there is a refractory period. Then if you apply a, a second sub threshold stimulus on the with the same intensity quickly before the refractory period ends. So, there will be a response that is there will be summation of these both stimulus and there will be a reaction will be there or action will be there. This is called tem temporal summation that is application of sub threshold and the second sub threshold will be applied before the refractory period it causes now a response will occur and each stimulus uh, that uh, because of the summation this is called temporal summation. Another type of summation is the spatial summation. Spatial summation means that is uh, if two sub threshold stimulus we are applying simultaneously at different spot it can evoke a response although individually individually individual stimulus fails to do so. So, again if you are applying a sub threshold it will not cause a response. If you are applying two sub threshold index stimulus at same intensity, so there will be summation it causes a response this is called a spatial summation. So, if two sub threshold stimulus applied simultaneously but different sport can evoke a response is called this is called a spatial summation. Next is irradiation. For example, if you are giving a low intensity stimulus, it can cause reflux contraction for a few muscles. If you are giving a strong stimulus, it can produce a reflux contraction of a large number of muscles. This is called irradiation. For example, if you are giving a small pin prick, you it, there may be your finger may you may withdraw your finger and if you are giving a big prick, your entire hand will be you may remove the entire hand or you withdraw entire hand. This is called irradiation. So, if you are giving a low intensity stimulus, it can cause reflux interaction contraction of the few muscles whereas, a strong stimulus can produce reflux contraction of large number of muscles. So, in this session we discussed about the what is reflexes, how the reflex is produced. Now, what is the ref, what is meant by reflex arc, what is the pathway of reflexes, how it is passed and it is a pathway including the receptor first of all the receptor then efferent nerve then center then efferent nerve and efferent organ. Then we classified the different types of reflexes the like superficial reflexes and we uh, discussed about the different types of superficial reflexes like congenital corneal uh, the conjunctival reflex, a conjunctival reflex, pupillary reflex, gag reflex, abdominal reflex, plantar reflex, 
Then we discussed about the uh, deep refluxes especially the, the tendon refluxes like jaw jerk, bicep jerk, tricep jerk, knee jerk, ankle jerk etc. Then we discussed about the some properties of refluxes like delay, summation, uh, 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 summation, irradiation etc. In this session we will be discussing about the spinal cord. All of us know that spinal cord lies in the vertebral canal. So, because of it is it is a it is as it is in, uh, inside the vertebral canal, this vertebral canal vertebra provides the protection of the spinal cord. So, the spinal cord it is extend from the foramen magnum as a continuation of the medulla that is at the cervical region. It starts from the con as a continuation of the as a, from the foramen magnum as a continuation of medul uh, medulla and comes down through this vertebral canal to the lower level of L1 and some in some cases it is to the upper level of L2. Then it this gives rise to a 31 pairs of the spinal nerve we already discussed regarding the spinal nerve and this spinal cord give rise to 31 pairs of spinal nerve and it comes down and at the in the lower level its lower part, part become conical shaped. This part is called conus medullaris. Now the apex of the conus part or conical part it is continued as phylum terminale. Now the cord present two thickening at the cervical and lumbar en enlargement and it give rise to large nerves to the limbs. So at the lumbar region and the cervical region there are two enlargement can be seen at the cord and this is the position where it give rise to uh, large nerves to the limbs because it uh, there will be lots of nerves goes to the lower limb and upper limb. Now, the nerve is spinal cord is shorter than the vertebral column. So, the nerve the nerves that arise from the lumbar sacral lumbosacral and coccygeal region of the spinal cord do not leave the vertebral column at the same level as they exit the cord because the spinal cord is short when compared to the vertebral column. Now, the root of these spinal nerves angled inferiorly in the vertebral cavity and form the end of the spinal cord, cord uh, uh, spinal cord like a wisp of hair that is at the low at the lower level at the lumbar region the roots of the spinal nerves which is coming down in the for the sacral region and coccygeal region this angled inferiorly in the vertebral cavity from the end of the spinal cord like a wisp of hair the root of this nerve is called corda equina or horse tail. So, this horse tail shaped, so it is called corda equina. Now, we already discussed that there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Spinal nerves are the part of the peripheral nervous system. The 31 pairs of the spinal nerve, it includes 8 in the cervical region. 12 in the thoracic region, 5 in the lumbar region, 5 in the coccygeal region, uh, 5 in the sacral region and 1 in the coccygeal region. Now, each pair of the spinal nerve passes through a pair of intervertebral foramina located between two successive vertebra. That is the root, it comes out from the spinal cord. Now, the spinal nerve, the spinal cord, it is having some covering for the protection especially for the protection. This covering of the spinal cord is known as meninges and this meninges is a three layers of connective tissue membrane. So, meninges is having again it is having three layers. The layers are called dura mater, arachnoid mater and pia mater. So, meninges is the covering of the spinal cord and it is a three layered covering. It includes the dura mater, arachnoid mater and pia mater. So, the dura mater. 
Now, it is a dense strong fi fibrous membrane that engloses the spinal cord and the cauda equina. So, dura mater it is the outer covering and it is continuous above through the foramen magnum with the meningeal layer of dura covering the brain. So, this meninges again covering the brain and this dura mater continues through the foramen magnum to the brain. Inferiorly, it ends at the phylum terminale at the level of the lower border of the second sacral vertebra. It comes down and reaches till the level of the second sacral vertebra. The dural sheath lies loosely in the vertebral canal and separated from the wall of the vertebral canal at the dural space. These contain loose connective tissue and the, and the internal vertebral venous fluxus also. So, this is the outer covering the dura mater. Dura mater extends along each spinal nerve root and is continuous with the connective tissue surrounding each spinal nerves. So, this is called epineurium. So, dura mater is continuous with the spinal nerve root. This is called epineurium. The inner surface of the dura mater is in contact with the arachnoid mater. Inside the dura mater, we have the arachnoid mater and the inner surface is in contact with the arachnoid mater. Now, the second layer is the arachnoid matter. Arachnoid matter is a delicate imper impermeable membrane that covers between the du that is lies between the dura matter externally and pia matter internally. It separates from pia by a white space called a subarachnoid space. The arachnoid matter continues along with the spinal nerve root forming a small lateral extension of the subarachnoid space. The third and the inner covering is called pia mater of the spinal cord it is called the third and the inner covering of the spinal cord is called pia mater. It is a vascular membrane that closely cover the spinal cord and is thickened on either side between the nerve root to form ligamentum denticulum which passes lateral and adhere to the arachnoid and dura mater. It forms the ligamentum denticulum. The pia mater extend along each nerve root and become continuous with the connective tissue surrounding each spinal nerve. Now, what is the function of this pia mater? Main thing is that protection. It protects the spinal cord and compression and uh, from shock and compression. And all these things protect the spinal nerve also. So, all these things, uh, the dura mater, pia mater, and arachnoid mater makes the spaces. There are spaces between all this. There is epidural space is there, subdural space is there, subarachnoid space is there. Epidural sp uh, space is external to the dura mater. Usually anesthetics are injected at this space. Next is the subdural space. It is below the dura mater. That is below the dura mater. It is, it is, it contains the serous fluid. Third space is the subarachnoid space. Subarachnoid space is the space between the pia mater and arachnoid mater. This is the space which is filled with cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. Now, what is cerebrospinal fluid? It is a modified tissue fluid. So, it is it contained in the subarachnoid space. It is also there in the ventricular system of the brain and subarachnoid space. So, it is there in the brain and the spinal cord. Now, its space around, it, it is seen in the subarachnoid space, only the subarachnoid space, but CSF reflex uh, that is in the subarachnoid space of the brain and it CSF reflex lymph in the central nervous system. That is, instead of lymph outside the body, here the cerebrospinal fluid is there. So, it says fluid, it is a tissue fluid, modified type of tissue fluid which is seen in the brain and spinal cord. And especially in the brain, it is seen at the sub uh, in the seen at the ventricular system. And in the spinal cord, it is at the subarachnoid space. Now, CSF replaces lymph in the CNS. Now, how the CSS is formed? CSF is formed. The bulk of the CSS is formed from the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle which is seen at the brain 
and a very small amount by the conoid fluxes of the third and fourth ventricle. So, formation of CSS, CSF is mainly from the choroid plexus and from the conoid plexus. That is, chor choroid plexus are present at the la lateral ventricle and conoid plexus are present at the third and fourth ventricle. So, CSF formation is that the choroid and conoid plexus. And it is also formed by some cap by the capillaries on the surface of the brain and spinal cord. So, formation of the CSF is from the choroid plexus and conoid plexus which is seen in the brain and it may be also may form from the capillaries and uh, capillaries uh, on the surface of the brain and spinal cord. Now, how much is the total amount of CSF in the body? It is around 150 ml and it is formed at the rate of 200 per ml per day that is uh, per hour. That is total amount of CSF is 150 ml and for it is formed at the rate of 200 ml per hour. And normal pressure formed by the CSF is 600 millimeter to uh, normal pressure formed by CSF is 60 millimeter to 10 millimeter of water. Now, how the CSF we discuss that CSF is a fluid. Which is, see, which is formed at the choroid plexus and conoid plexus and which is seen at the uh, arachnoid space also, which is seen in the subarachnoid space. So, where, how the circulation is of the CSF? There are two lateral ventricles communicate with the interventricular foramen. This is called, uh, this is uh, called foramen of Munro with the third ventricles. That is two lateral ventricle communicate with the interventricular foramen with the third ventricle. The third ventricle is connected with the fourth ventricle by aqueduct of Sylvius. The fourth ventricle is in, uh, is in uh, continu con continuation with the narrow central canal of the spinal cord and through the third, for uh, through the third foramina and its roof with the subarachnoid space. Now, the central canal has small dilatation at its inferior end referred as terminal ventricle. The CFS of passes from each lateral ventricle to the third ventricle through interventricular foramina or foramina, foramina of Munro and ends from third ventricle to the fourth ventricle and through aqueduct of Sylvius. And from fourth ventricle, CF puff passes to the subarachnoid space through the medial and lateral, uh, 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 through that is from third ventricle to the, from fourth ventricle, CSF passes to the subarachnoid space. Again, the pathway of the CSF, the central, uh, that is CSF passes from each lateral ventricle to the third ventricle through interventricular foramen, that is foramen of Mandra, and from third ventricle, to the fourth ventricle through aqueduct of Sylvius, from fourth ventricle to the subarachnoid space. Now, CSF absorption. CFSF is absorbed chiefly by arachnoid villi and granulation and its granulation and is drained into the cranial venous sinuses. It is also absorbed by partially by perineural lymphatics around the first, second, seventh and eighth cranial lymph. It is also absorbed by veins related to the spinal nerves. Now, the, what is the function of the CSF? It is having protective function. It gives nutrition and it is the pathway of excretion from the CNS. Now, cerebrospinal fluid are present inside the cerebral. We discussed about the cerebrospinal fluid and the uh, different protective membranes. Now, once this protective membrane of the covering may get inflamed, this inflammation of the protective covering of the brain and spinal cord is called meningitis. It may be caused by any virus or bacteria or any other microorganism. Sometimes even some drugs also may cause the in inflammation and inf inflammation of the meninges. So, meningitis is a term used to discuss the, it used to describe the inflammation of the meningeal covering of the brain and spinal cord, usually caused by 
bacterial, viral and other microorganism infection. So, it is a life threatening condition because it is this meninges is very proximity to the brain and spinal cord. So, it is a medical emergency. So, treatment has to be done as early as possible. So, meningitis is inflammation to the meninges or inflammation to the coverings of the brain and spinal cord. And as it is very proximity, it is in very proximity with the brain and spinal cord. It is life threatening. So, it is a medical emergency. Now, what are the most common symptoms seen in meningitis? Usually headache may be there. There may be neck stiffness associated with fever, confusion, altered consciousness. There is chance of vomiting, inability to tolerate light that is photophobia and inability to tolerate loud noise that is phonophobia. These are the symptoms, meningitis, headache may be there, neck stiffness may be there, vomiting may be there, photophobia and phonophobia may be there. Now, lumbar puncture. So, whenever we need CSF because to diagnose to for a diagnostic purpose, we have to collect the CSF, cerebrospinal fluid from the subarachnoid space. So, this procedure is known as lumbar puncture. So, lumbar puncture can be defined as or it is a diagnostic procedure, diagnostic at a time therapeutic procedure that is performed in order to collect the sample of CSF for biochemical, for microbiological or cytological analysis or sometimes as a treatment to relieve increased intracranial pressure. So, in order for biochemical or microbiological or analysis, sometimes we need for the investigative purposes or as for most diagnostic purpose, we use CSF. So, this cerebrospinal fluid, the collection is done by <coughs> the procedure is called lumbar puncture. In order to do the lumbar puncture, a spinal needle is needed. Spinal needle is inserted between the lumbar vertebrae at the level of L3 or L4 or L4 or L5. So, and CSF will be aspirated or CSF will be taken. So, lumbar puncture is a diagnostic procedure usually, but even for therapy, there is a, another lump type of lumbar puncture called therapeutic puncture, lumbar puncture. Is, this is in order to relieve intracranial pressure because maybe because of high volume of the or any uh, increased pressure in the inside the brain or spinal cord. We can remove little bit of uh, that, uh, that CSF which relieve the pressure. So, lumbar puncture it is a diagnostic and therapeutic procedure done by a spinal needle and at the level of L3, L4 or L4, L5. Now, we were discussing about the uh, anatomy of the spinal cord. We will go through the cross section of the spinal cord. Once you see the cross section of the spinal cord, there will be a tiny canal, central canal in the spinal cord. A tiny central canal is present at the center of the spinal cord and this tiny central canal contain cerebrospinal fluid. Now, there are gray matter and white matter is present at the spinal cord. The gray matter is inside and white matter is outside the spinal cord. So, there is a inside gray matter and outside, gray mat outside white matter is there in the spinal cord. Now, gram matter forms H shaped structure that is inside you can see in the you can see in the picture there is a H shaped structure can be seen it is made up of gram matter. Now, the white matter is seen outside. Now, the spinal cord is divided into more or less symmetrical halves by a deep groove called anterior median fissure. You can see an anterior median fissure or ventral median fissure on the anterior side and a median septum called a posterior median sulcus or septum on the posterior side. So, we can divide the spinal cord into two parts by through this septum and this uh, fissure. There is an anterior median fissure 
and a posterior median sulcus or posterior median fissure is can be uh, septum can be seen in the spinal cord. Now, from both sides of the spinal cord, from the gram matter, we can see extending from the spinal cord, there are ventral and dorsal roots of the spinal nerve emerge from the gram matter of the spinal cord. Now, the gram matter, gram matter this contain especially the neuron cells, body, cell bodies, dendrites and axon is the main part of this gram matter. So, because of this pinkish grey color, because of that it is called as grey matter, it is due to the presence of rich network of blood. Now, the grey matter can be divided into three parts, posterior horns, anterior horns and lateral horns. So, there are posterior, two posterior horns are there, you can see two anterior horns are there and two lateral horns on lateral sides. So, this is this forms this will get H shaped gram matter. So, the gram matter can be divided into anterior horns, posterior horns and lateral horns. So, that is that is about gram matter. Now, outside the gram matter we have white matter. It is mainly composed of myelinated nerve fibers that is why the color become white. The white matter can be divided into three pair of column or faniculae of myelinated fibers. There is an anterior, uh, posterior lateral, anterior is the, there is an anterior faniculae, there is a posterior faniculae, there is a uh, lateral faniculae, then there is a commissure area also. Now, the bundle of the fibers with each faniculae are divided into tracts. So, the, the white matter contain lots of tracts. So, there are lots of bundle of nerve fibers are there at each faniculae and this bundle of fibers are called the tracts or fasciculae. Now, there are, there are lots of fibers, nerve fibers are there. This is known as tracts. There are two types of tracts commonly seen at the white matter. These are the ascending tracts and the descending tracts. Ascending tracts, these are, this contain sensory fibers. These sensory fibers, these ascending tracts carry impulse up to the spinal cord, uh, up the spinal cord from the, sp through the spinal cord to the brain. This is called ascending tracts. And there are descending tracts. Here, these are the motor tracts. That is motor neuron transmit impulse from brain down the spinal cord. So, inside the white matter there are tracts are available, there are two types of tracts are there, there are ascending tracts and descending tracts. Ascending tracts are the sensory tracts or so they carry the sensory, these sensory fibers carry impulses up the spinal cord to the brain and descending tracts are the motor tracts or motor neuron transmit impulses from brain down to the spinal cord.